so very grateful for all of the be beautiful music today, not only of the season, but from uh, hearts I know that uh, love the Lord, love this church, and that uh, celebrate together today uh, the birth of baby Isaac uh, for our pastor and his wife. We're uh, grateful to have that uh, moment of celebration uh, in our church as well. The word of the Lord today is um, in keeping with the season. Uh, I'm grateful to Sophia for reading the verse a moment ago. You know it well. It announces uh, Christ's birth as our Savior. There's also a song by country artist Jelly Roll. Peaked uh, at number 13 on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100. Uh, back during the summer. Uh, the title was Need a Favor. Uh, song in This song in particular marked his second appearance uh, on the Hot 100. He had had the, the first one, uh, which was titled uh, Son of a Sinner. There's a theme developing there uh, for the singer in spite of the, the words and the crassness of some of them. But the words to need a favor are, I only talk to God when I need a favor, and I only pray when I ain't got a prayer. So who am I to expect a Savior if I only talk to God when I need a favor? Jelly sings on. I know amazing grace, but I ain't been living them words. Swear I spend most Sundays drunk than I have at church. Hardcover King James only been saving dust on the nightstand. And I don't know what to say by the time I fold my hands. So, let me ask the well-dressed, the delightful folks, the beautiful people, uh, here at South Garland Baptist Church on this second Sunday of Advent, do you really need a Savior? You may have had that point in your life when you came to the recognition and the point that you needed a Savior, and so you admitted that you were a sinner as possibly uh, someone had directed you or led you to the Lord. You had that time in your life when you came to say, God, I'm a sinner. I know you can't save me unless I admit I'm a sinner. I've missed the mark. I have sinned. You know, it really gets me that Paul, that apostle of note in the New Testament, writes about himself, I am the chief of sinners. What gets me about that is that I know that I follow him a close second. But here's the part I don't want you to miss as well in the message today. And that is that we can be certain that God, the one who sent his son, the one who gives to us a savior, is also the one that says in his word that I you and I, are a person of worth created in the image of God. You have value and meaning and worth. And remember that it's also this same God who told Moses to tell Pharaoh about the one who sent him to him. Just tell him, it's telling Moses to say to Pharaoh, I am sent me. You have an I am. It is true about you as well. I am because of God and that's why he wants to be your savior. See, God wants to be your savior. And so he sent the Christ child, he sent the baby in the manger so that you will be his, a child of God. You'll be saved from missing the mark, from being a sinner, whatever the sin might be. And so it is that we can know him as our Savior. 
we can know as well that one individual life is of a priceless value to God's purpose. One life is of infinite value, not more than the others, but each one, and you are that life. That's why the Christ child came, for you. I like the old preacher thing that uh, sometimes the way you best repeat John 3.16 is not just so that God loved the whole world, but that God loved me. God loved, fill in the blank with your name, God loved each of us, and so he desires to be the Savior of each of us. Israel's uh, Messiah, the Savior, her anointed and appointed king, had finally come. That's in the second chapter of Luke. And God chose to announce his son's birth, not to the uh, political or religious leaders of the day, but to a group of humble shepherds. Out there on that hillside, in the middle of the night, he announces that the Savior has come, the Savior of all people. He announces it to a group of humble shepherds because, first, he was the Savior of all people. And so he announced it to some of the lowest level of people because in some ways I think the intention was it's easier for all of the rest of us to get the idea that he's our savior too. Came to the simplest of people. He was the savior of all people. But also he announced his coming, the Christ child coming, to be offered as a sacrificial lamb like those cared for by the shepherds. In fact, it tells us in verse 12 there that a sign will be for you to find this baby, to find the Savior, tightly wrapped in strips of cloth. That's the meaning of swaddling clothes in the New Testament. There were strips of cloth. It is also that they were among some of the cheapest of the cloths. But in this baby, wrapped in these claws, lying in a manger, a feed trough in a barn, the shepherds would understand that the baby would be tightly wrapped as they would tightly wrap a baby lamb. To keep that lamb from being harmed or blemished because they knew that they could get the most for that lamb that would be unblemished, uninjured, they could get the most for that one for the people that would sacrifice the lambs. And so our Savior was also tightly wrapped in claws so that he would be unblemished and uninjured for the gift that he would become for our sins. It was to keep them spotless to gain the best price. Jesus was tightly wrapped for us as well, not blemished or injured, so that he could be our Savior, the perfect, the perfect gift. The season of Advent, as I had shared earlier, is about Christ coming. It's to remind us that we need a Savior. I'm saying to us today in remembrance and reminder that we only need once to say, I need a Savior. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus, come into my heart and life. That only needs to happen once in our lives, but still the story each year reminds us of our need for a Savior. We need Jesus in our lives. It's kind of like the Lord's Supper reminds us of what Jesus did when he died for us. We have to have it more than just once in a while or once in a year because the, uh, the key to this is to understand that it's a reminder of Jesus' sacrificed body in 
communion. And so it is that we're reminded of Christ coming for us as our Savior. It's the good news told to us in messages that are sermons, as well as in the cards that are shared with people, as well as those conversations around the table that are shared at Christmas time that remind us that the Savior has come, that we need a Savior because we are sinners. And that there's also, I think, inherent in that is a reminder to us that it's not just that we are sinners and then we are saved and we never sin again, but that we continue to sin, we continue to need a Savior. That's that meaning of those terms in the New Testament in the beautiful language of Greek that's given to us in a progressive sense. We are about being saved. Being saved is something that we experience throughout our life as the work of Christ in our hearts and lives. The cure for sin, which Jesus was. The cure for sin, even in our Savior, is worthless if we don't recognize that we're a sinner and that we continue to sin. So Jesus is needed still in our lives. I know that that's a fairly new thought. Maybe it's an uncomfortable thought to think that we continue to sin, that we are sinners. Maybe you're not comfortable with the word drunk being used in a sermon on Sunday morning to all ages that come to worship. But the truth is, there continues to be sin in our lives. There continues to be those things that happen to our loved ones and our families that are so unfair and so difficult that there are those days in which we find loved ones who are drinking too much, who are hooked on drugs. It happens. It happens to church people. And so we find ourselves still in the midst of this that our Savior called sin. It is that a part of what happened last night. I was sharing to a, a friend, actually was sharing with me. I kept, felt like he was circling me. You know, sometimes pastors get that kind of innate sense. I kept thinking he was circling me, and so he wanted to tell me something, and so he told me about his grandson, 12 years old. He's in school. Happens to be a private school. It's not really part of the story, except that it reminds us that even in the church, there's sin. But it seems as though there were some boys that took it upon themselves since uh, his grandson is smaller in stature, enjoys singing and the arts much more than sports. They decided that it would be really fun to pull down the young boy's pants in front of a group of girls. And what that would say to me, as much as he asked me to pray for his grandson, and I will, his grandson is considering if he has a life that's even worth living. And I say to him, and I say to myself, and I share with you today, there's still sin in the world. And sometimes sin pops up its ugly head in the most decent of places. And so that's not only the reason that there's a need for a Savior, but that's the reason that there continues to be the need for a Savior. And when we recognize that we are sinners and that we continue to sin, so Jesus is needed still in our lives as the Savior. The Savior said, in fact, in the Lord's Prayer, give us today our daily bread. And did he not also pray and forgive us our trespasses? It could be that as he asked for daily bread, he was asking for daily forgiveness for trespasses against him because we continue to sin. One of my best experiences of personal revival has come when I realized and I have realized to the point of being heartbroken about my own sin. 
that I too continue to sin. It's happening this Christmas season again when I'm realizing that a Savior is born is not just something we sing. Oh, it's wonderful to sing. The music this morning was beautiful. I so appreciate Generations Chorale. Your music was beautiful. The tone, the notes, I do not know all about it, as Shane would know or Diane or other musicians in our church, but I know the music was beautiful, and I know also that a part of what I heard in the music today was not just the words. It was the meaning that the folks in Generations Chorale shared with us as well, because we need that. We need that camaraderie and that understanding that as sinners, we need to know the beautiful story about the babe in the manger. Something that we know, not only the music and the words, but what it means to me. So let me share this with you today. In closing, you know what that means when a Baptist preacher says, in closing, absolutely nothing. And so uh, this is near the end, so don't miss this part, okay? I want to ask you, and you answer in your own heart. You can tell me the answer later. Email me. Let me know. Why is it that more people are not responding to the gospel? Why is it that there are not more people coming to know this Christ child? Why is it that there are not more people who can kind of get their lives together enough to help others out and do even more good for the cause of Christ? Or You, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm asking? I'm wondering if sometimes, and I put this on myself, and I guess I share this with you today, um, it's like the gospel group, uh, hold a jelly roll at first so I better redeem the situation by referring here to uh, Greater Vision, wonderful, wonderful gospel group. But listen to what they sing when they say about people like me. Preacher, tell it like it is. Because in their music, which has become in this song so convicting to me, but so appropriate for this coming of the Savior. Preacher, I'd say it's been a while since you heard this request, but my spirit is tired and I need rest. I want to hear from heaven a clear word from God, a sermon of conviction straight from the heart. I've been hearing other preachers say I don't have to change. The most eloquent of speakers tell me I'm okay, but it hasn't eased my conscience, and I know it's not the truth. So when you stand before us, preacher, can I count on you? Oh, preacher, you say you want to be my friend. Don't be afraid to call my sin what it is. And preacher, tell me I can overcome, but it's only by the blood of the Lamb. Don't tell me like I wish it was. Preacher, tell me like it is. Oh, preacher, you say you want to be my friend. It's a part of what you do when you open the word and let the spirit lead. Preach until I've heard God speak to me. Don't worry about my feelings. Don't worry about my shame. Just preach the cross of Jesus and that I'm to blame. The last verse of that is, life is quickly passing. The world is fading fast. And the foolishness of preaching is the only hope we have. My word to us today is just to remember, I'm not the only preacher here today. Pastor Daniel's not the only preacher there is for our church. You are a preacher too. You are the ones to take the message out beyond these walls. Christmas comes to restore your confident hope Christmas comes to restore true joy. It's amazing to consider how much the birth of Jesus changed those who experienced it firsthand. It was Mary who was changed from peasant girl to mother of our Savior. The shepherds from sheep watchers to lamb worshipers. The magi, the wise men were changed from stargazers 
to light seekers. God's power to change us is just as real as it was back then. On that night when the angels sang, would you consider the life-changing transformation in your life if you've never before said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner? If there's someone here, and we pray for this pretty often around here, that God would bring to us people who don't know Jesus. I hope it's a part of your prayers regularly. But if you've never before in your life invited Jesus in, would you consider that now? It's a life-transforming decision. It's a life-transforming work. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It does mean that some of those things we really hate to admit to one another creep into our lives and they're a part of our church. But would you consider coming to Jesus today? For a lot of us, Jesus brought to, to those in the first nativity, and, and so I invite you today to open your heart to his power to change uh, your life today. To turn from the way you're walking, not just in sin, but sometimes in complacency. Sometimes it's turning from, changing from being so upset about every single thing that moves in our marriages, in our businesses, in our churches. And allow God simply to come and bring about what is that consistent and continual repentance that's needed in our lives. I've come to understand that if you ever cease to understand the value of repentance, even as a Christian, as a believer, you allow yourself to remain in sin. 2 Corinthians 7.10 reminds us godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Here's the invitation today. It's a hymn we'll sing. We stand. We're real comfortable with that. We like that. Today, while you're singing, uh, I will offer a, a representation of this church, mainly of our Lord, and stand here at the front uh, to greet someone with whom the Spirit is dealing or want prayer or a particular need. It's not just to join the church, but if you want to join our church, you, you can make a pastor who's at home today with his new baby extremely happy. We, we have a few memberships available, and so... Uh, if you would like to join this church, you're welcome. We are praying. We are praying consistently, if not daily, for new members here. But from where you stand in the invitation this morning, it might be that you would stop singing the hymn and simply bow your head and pray to Almighty God that he would come again to you afresh and anew in a Christmas sort of way. In a Christmas spirit that says we're open to what God has done for us in providing Jesus as our Savior. It's decision time for all of us in all sorts of ways. Come to Christ, join the church, might be where you're standing, you could rededicate your life so that you might know that you have a Savior who loves you. You've not done anything to disqualify yourself from God's love. It might be that it's a good word for you to hear is that uh, this could be the very best Christmas you will ever experience. Let's pray together.